Hi, this is Pat McDonald, your host for Vote for Vermont, where our tagline is listening beyond the sound bites. Ben Kinsley is joining me as co-host. Ben, how are you? I'm excellent. Thank you, I, Pat. I heard that. It must have been from you, I heard that. <laughs> it must have been. <laughs> anyway, tonight we have a very interesting topic to talk about, and it's housing. Uh, housing crisis, I heard that word as well while I was doing my research. And with us today is uh, Peter Tucker. I'm going to have to read this, Peter. Sure. Who's the Advocacy and Public Policy Director for the Vermont Association of Realtors. Welcome. Thank you. Glad Welcome. to have you join mm -hmm. us. And next is Ken Libby, who we've known each other a few years. 40 per, yes. plus or minus. You, <laughs> you had to put a number on yeah, it. Right, right. <laughs> anyway, Ken's the manager of the Stowe Area Realty Group of Keller Williams in the Stowe office, and he has had many awards. The most recent, I believe, is the winner of the NAR Distinguished Service Award. Mm -hmm. You, you did your homework. Oh, I did well. Actually, I've, I've always kind of said congrats whenever they've posted the the latest award. But and that's a is, national award. This is, yeah, that's yeah. the National mm -hmm. Association of Realtors. It's very prestigious. They give two a year. We have a million, 500,000 members. Two a year get, yeah. get, get, get the award. Yep. That's great. Well, you've done what, I mean, I'll start with Peter to talk about you and who you are, but um, I can talk about you. That would be excellent. <laughs> is that it? <laughs> Maybe not. Don't worry. Peter, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? And Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. So um, I, I New to the government affairs uh, staff position with the Realtor Association, um, 25 years as a broker, primarily in Stowe. You know, so Ken and I are you know comrades from from that uh, environment. Um, but uh, you know, with COVID and everything else going on, the opportunity was presented to come in house and, and work uh, in advocacy and public uh, public affairs. And so I chose to do that. And when did you start doing that? Because you look. Very sure. familiar. I mean, this is the first, mm -hmm. second time we've sort of met face to face. Right. But I've seen you up at the state house. Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, the ten years as a as a volunteer with the, the Realtor Association oh. is kind of the background, you know, and why you know I was so interested in it. I was president in 2011 of the Vermont Association of Realtors, and then chair or member of government affairs ever since then. So the background was there, and then the opportunity to do it as a, as a staff person uh, came along. Well, congrats. Well, thank you. Sounds yeah, like a great about a year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Ken? Pat, it's good to see you. Thank you. you it's been a while. Thank you. Ben, uh, Bruce says hello. Brett, uh, I was going to suggest you say hi to yes, Bruce. Thank you. Pat and I have known each other since the days I was police chief in Stowe, which I retired from, strangely enough, in two months. It'll be 30 years. Wow. I retired in, early, in the early part of 2000, and, uh, excuse me, 1992. Mm -hmm. So I've been doing real estate full time in Stowe since then, but I've been really licensed in Vermont since 1998, or uh, 78. So 43 years, 44 years. Very active at the national level. Um, I serve on the Federal Taxation Committee for the National Association and have for a number of years. And we deal with a lot of these issues in that committee, uh, as you might guess. Mm -hmm. uh, this last, last two years, we've been working heavily on some of the tax bills that have come out, of, that have been introduced in Congress anyhow. So, so far, most of them haven't come out. Mm. But, uh, and I've been active in the Vermont legislative scene. I was lobbyist, as Pat knows. I was yes, a lobbyist right. for 30 years for law enforcement. Mm -hmm. So I used to know where to get my breakfast and make things happen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Where the real action happens. Always, Always in the cafeteria. Cafeteria. Yeah. 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 We were just talking about that the last time about watching that's the walks with who in the hallway. Mm -hmm. You're like, oh. That's yep. what you miss in the virtual legislative yeah, session is the, right. the, the hallway yeah. and cafeteria, you know. Mm -hmm. That's right, stuff for sure. That Shenanigans. <laughs> well, first I should say Stowe's been in a particularly crazy in the last uh, year and a half or so through the pandemic. In the real estate market. In the real estate market, right? Well, the whole state, the whole country has been. It's it's mm -hmm. not defined to Stowe at all. Um, I do a lot of work. I have 20 agents in, the, in my Keller Williams office. Uh, and we have some one in Barton, and one in Newport, and all over the all over the state. And there's no inventory anywhere. Yeah. And it's it's very difficult. We have, we all have a lot of buyers, and that's part of the part of the driving force behind some of the housing crisis that we have. I mean, the low end housing market, the, the what we call the starter market, the beginner market, doesn't exist mm -hmm. because usually people that are 
the, in a house for six or eight years, outgrow it and move up to another house and right. make that house available for a newcomer. And there's nothing in that next step for them to move to. So they make do with what they have. So that's a great lead in um, to what we want to talk about tonight, which mm -hmm. is uh, housing, um, which obviously Vermont realtors are incredibly involved in. Um, and you probably have a, I would imagine, a better sense of what's going on than most people, maybe even more so than the policy makers and regulators and state government about what's happening. And we hear this uh, housing crisis. Some people say it's a, it's a uh, availability issue. Some people say it's an affordability issue. Mm -hmm. Perhaps it's a bit of both. Um, what what do the two of you and, and I guess um, Peter, I'll start with you. Like, sure. What do you guys think of when you hear someone talk about the housing crisis? Right. So you know, we've been looking at this over the past year. Yeah. Well, since I've I've come on board, I guess you know our government affairs committee. You know, we debate this every meeting that we have, and you know the the challenge is is clearly a supply issue. There are not enough new homes being built. Um, you know, Ken and I have gone to national conferences where our, our economist, Lawrence Yoon, has been saying, you know, nationwide we're missing by, you know, 100,000 units, you know, and, and, and this has been going on year after year. So it's not just Vermont, but it's certainly, you know, we're looking at it and saying, you know, this is why we have an issue, because we don't have the supply of new homes to offer for sale. Um, so, you know, trying to create um, opportunities for builders and developers um, to build some of that workforce housing, especially, you know, we feel that, that at the high end, housing pretty much takes care of itself. You know, if somebody wants to build a $2 million mansion, they can do that. Can you know, it's. Said, you mentioned work, workforce? Workforce housing. What does that, what does that sure. mean? Sure. So think about uh, nurses, uh, firemen, policemen, teachers. You know, so that's middle, kind of the yeah. standard, you know, middle class uh, group. Working folks yeah. Who, you know, okay. and, and as Ken says, you know, where's the property available for them? And it just, it isn't clearly available right now, right? There is not enough of right. those kind of homes. And, and then, you know, what that does, it freezes up the marketplace. Right. So then all of a sudden, you know, people are challenged. They're, they're all competing for the same property. And, you know, that's where price appreciation occurs. Um, yep. we've, you know, people have seen tremendous appreciation of their home values in the last two years. My neighbor put mm -hmm. her house on the market, an old house, and built mm -hmm. very cute. And, they, and that she was offered way more than the asking price. Right. She sold it in a week. Yep. Yeah. Gone. I, mean, I said, you better be ready to move. The appreciation that you're talking about yeah. is because that's people know, like, people will buy whatever is available. Exactly. Even if it's below their what their price point normally be. So they'll offer high to make sure right. they get it because that's what's available. Well, anecdotally, I've heard that people are buying houses sight unseen. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's true, but, but that's because they want to get out of New York or get out of uh, the, the city environment. And mm -hmm. so, but, I don't know, but what do you think about housing crisis and... As Peter said, it's the driving force behind the crisis at the moment. But the crisis mm -hmm. has been going on for 10 years. Ah. Um, on the national level mm -hmm. and the, even in Vermont, the number of new starts has dwindled dramatically since 2009. Mm -hmm. And Lawrence June is the economist for our National Association, YUN is the last name if you want to Google him. He's one of the most respected economists mm. in the nation. And he says we're about uh, 15 million houses short, new Whoa. starts. Mm -hmm. uh, because normally we would see anywhere from a million and a half to two million starts every year. Mm -hmm. And it's been 12 years uh, since the builders have been thri building anywhere near the number of homes they need. Same thing in Vermont. Um, and there's different reasons all around the country. There was a report this afternoon came out about 2.30 on Inman News that uh, new home starts in the nation in second home markets is up 36% this year over last year. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not true in my market, my second home market, mm -hmm. for a multitude of reasons. And th there is more building going on right now, but it's at the high end. It's all oh, at the high end. Mansions. Um, you, first of all, you can't. With some of the rules and restrictions that are out there, you can't build low-end product, low-end being two hundred to three hundred thousand dollar houses. 
uh, the cost of the lumber, the cost of the materials is a, is a prohibitive factor that's right. getting better now, it's coming down. The uh, ability to purchase and hold the land, the developers used to buy up a track of land and hold it. But when the market went to pieces back in 09, 0, and 10, 11, they stopped doing that. So they don't have the inventory of land. Huh. And now to go out and buy the land, um, almost all the land that's available for housing is somewhat in conflict with the state's stated goals, legislative stated goals, i.e. they want downtown concentration on quarter acre lots. Yeah. Um, and they won't permit uh, multi-family homes on those quarter acre lots. They want just single family homes. That's not cost productive. Is that in law? Is that it's a, it's a, a uh, housing development reg oh, interpretation oh, of the law. Oh, okay. the rulemaking. State. Yeah, yeah. rulemaking. Um, and then most of the open land is out. If you take Stowe, for instance, it's out towards Morrisville. It's down towards Waterbury. Right. If you look at uh, Middlesex, it's, it's away from the core center of the municipality. Waitsfield's going through this right now. It's, they got some quarter acre lots actually mm -hmm. in the village of Waitsfield. But, but the open land is outside. So if somebody goes out there and buys that, they got all kinds of issues they have to deal with with Act 250 and so forth. And the most critical one that really is stymieing, in my opinion, some of the housing capability is the Ag Land Reimbursement Program, mitigation program. Uh, so if yeah. you build on it, there's, there's one right now, I forget where it is, I think it's in uh, St. Albans. A four acre parcel that is surrounded by, on one side the hospital, on the other side a senior living center, oh, yeah. and there's this four acre parcel that this guy wants to build on, and the state wants $22,000 for agricultural mitigation. Hmm. Well, it may have been a farm at one time, yeah. 35, 40 years right. ago, it hasn't been a farm in a long time, and who's gonna farm a four acre parcel? Right. Hmm. Yet the state wants to ding them for $22,000 for for that, so there was a parcel in Stowe the, a few years ago that was a farm. It was like 50 acres on the mountain road, called the Gale Farm, yeah. mm -hmm. and it got all split up. One came a shopping center went in. The Shed Restaurant was part of that. Uh, there was another shopping center on that side of the street, but there was 25 acres in the back of the old farmhouse that was open land, and it was owned by five different people. Uh. So one of the local business people bought those five lots from those five people and put it back together so he could have a parcel that he mm -hmm. could do something, do something with. with. Right. And the, the cost that the state wanted was $78,000 for agricultural mitigation. Oh, wow. And there was no agricultural capability to the land until he brought it and brought it back together. Yeah. I, you know, you asked me about my background a little bit. Uh, I did 10 years as president of Lamoille Economic Development Corporation. Oh, no kidding. And I did five years on uh, Act 250, District 5, when, oh, bless you. when Howard Dean was governor. So we've had these discussions before. <laughs> I don't think they, they were working on Act 250 for a couple of years, um, the yeah, committee. Yeah, and it hasn't did, gone nothing, Nothing's happened. Peter's yeah. an expert. It's just sitting. Are you our Act 250 expert? Well, I'll have to I'll, bring you back someday because that thing just boggles my mind sometimes when you read it and try to figure out the logic. Right. Well, in, in the logic 52 years ago was without a lot of local zoning, you know, the state needed to do something to, to curtail rampant development. Right. And, you know, as a, as a tool, I think it was, a, it was pretty effective. Um, I think the challenge now, because in the previous legislative session, you know, they worked on it for two years, couldn't get consensus, just right. it was a huge battle, and nothing happened, as you say. Um, I think the challenge is that we waited 50 years to try and modify it. Right. You know, if we had been making changes as, you know, um, engineering, environment, all of those things were, you know, we were becoming more aware of and more capable of dealing with, um, you know, we would have a, a, a bill or a, you know, a legislation that, that kind of works for the time. But because we've waited so long, now it becomes this huge issue. The, throw it out and start over again. Well, so, you know, the realtors, our position um, is that, you know, what 
that Act 250 has to be looked at in this particular environment as a housing issue, not as an environmental issue. And, and it's not to say that, that this is gonna be that, that broad-based reform, but rather let's pick out some targeted, specific right. activities that can change in Act 250 that will allow potentially for more housing to be created. Right. And, and that's where the realtors are coming from. We were watching Act 250 for a while and there mm -hmm. were some being kind, very interesting uh, proposals from mm -hmm. the committee members. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm home like yelling, right. what are you doing? Mm -hmm. I mean, they were out to lunch. Sorry, love you all, but mm -hmm. they, they really missed the big picture. Well, the they, problem, I think, comes down to, um, in large part, we saw this particularly in the Senate, I think, last year, mm -hmm. is that Act 250 discussions often are driven by the environmental committees mm -hmm. in the legislature, mm -hmm. not by the Economic Development and Housing right. Commis right. Committees. Right. And this is where you had, like you were talking about, they couldn't get consensus. It was particularly in the Senate, two committees that could not find common ground mm -hmm. because right. they had two different versions of the bill and in basically the leadership in the Senate said, work it out. They couldn't work it out. Yeah, it got pretty they had intense. totally different ideas on what Act 250 is and is supposed to do. Mm -hmm. We've had businesses in here and their, and their approach is just make it clear what it's going to cost and what it is. Mm -hmm. That's all anybody's just, ever asked. That's just yeah. predictability. We used that word one, yeah. you know, for a whole mm -hmm. year in, in these, yeah. these shows. They just want predictability. So when sure. they go in to start a project, they know how much it's going to cost and they can make adjustments. But it keeps changing, apparently, as one goes through the project. And it seems to me we keep saying um, we want people and we need workers, and pe but yet we don't want to have them live in houses. So uh, mm -hmm. it's kind of a make up your it, mind what it, you it, want. It, and it's not always just Act 250 either. I mean, there's a lot of municipalities that have oh, done yeah, some sure. very strange things. Yeah. Elmore, as an example, and I'll pick on them a little bit because I'm very familiar with them. They have a, just an incredible zoning requirement that that used to say until recently that no house could be built above 1,500 foot elevation, which is 35, 40 percent of the town. Mm -hmm. uh, other communities in the area have 2,000 as a break off. Stowe has what they call ridge line development, so anything that's viewable from that ridge over there has to go mm -hmm. through special uh, use special exterior colors. You have right. to use natural woods and natural mm -hmm. uh, roof has to be dark, et cetera, so you can't see it across the valley. Oh, I see. But there's a way to mitigate that stuff with, with, uh, with building materials and mm -hmm. trees. So the state says it's 2,500. That's their break off. Uh, most of the towns have 2,000. Some have 1,800. You can't build above 1,800 foot elevation. Elmore had 1,500 for years. I know of one parcel that has 12 building lots between 1,500 and 1,600 elevation that they can't build on. They, they've tested it. They have the sewer capability, septic capability. Wow. And then Elmore just recently reduced the 1,500 to 1,200. So you can't build above 1,200 foot elevation. Mm -hmm. That's, I don't know what, what the number is, but is I'll that? bet it's 40% of the land mass of the yeah. town of Elmore. I'm trying to figure in my head what kind of, is that a two-story but pretty small. I mean, how big are these homes? They, they it just could be to... anything. You know, at at 1,200, at 1,300 foot elevation, it could it's, be it's very much a $300,000 house. Oh, oh okay. Um, uh, some of the houses are big houses, and there's some rather modest houses yeah. uh, mm -hmm. all over the, you know. Interesting. You think Elmore is all out Route 12, all the way right, to Worcester. Right, mm -hmm. A lot of land mass available there. Interesting. Yeah. So is it is it a mix? It's a mix of land lots that are available, right? Housing lots that are available. Mm -hmm. um, it's a mix of that. It's a mix of regulations, like where you can build houses, what kind of houses they are. Are they single family? Are they multifamily? Is there uh, water and sewer available? Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned briefly uh, material costs. Like it may not even be physically possible mm -hmm. to build a $200,000 house today with the cost of materials, right? Is that accurate? 
Material costs have definitely, you know, put a strain on that. And I and I would also say that that now, as as prices start to come down on lumber, you know, you heard about the cost of a two by four and how it tripled. Oh my gosh! You know, yeah. And, yeah. and that's so that's Home Depot, and it's like, right. oh, what happened? <laughs> right. You know, retirement plan in the back of a pickup. Yeah. yeah. You know, so that's that's rolling back a little bit. But I I still think that availability of materials for construction is going to be a big issue for builders. You know, and that's something that, you know, we've tried to. To look at you know what is involved in construction of, of homes you know and there's a kind of an acronym the five L's of construction that's lumber labor land legal uh, which is permitting and lending which is the financing for it you know and you know as you start to break that down as far as the material costs what we've tried to do is encourage our federal delegation to look at tariffs on, on building materials. Mm -hmm. And you know, so we're trying to, to, to really understand you know, what have been the pressures that have kept builders from wanting to, to increase the supply of housing mm -hmm. and, uh, and really look at those different factors. And you, know, you can't solve all these problems, but you know, what we're trying to do is say, you know, here, here, are, here are the issues and here are some potential solutions. And um, you know, and really try to get. I mean, the, the, when we talk to legislators now, they want to talk about housing. Um, the challenge that the Realtor Association has is that you know, most of the ARPA funds, most of the discussion on affordable housing is for folks exiting homelessness and for subsidized rental housing. And you know, that's the right thing, right? Especially in the pandemic, that was the right thing to do. You know, our piece of the housing discussion is really in those properties for sale. And you know, we we believe beyond having a roof over your head that that owning a house provides stability for the family, stability for the community, uh, kids do better and you know provides multi-generational wealth for families as exactly. they start to carry those houses forward generation to generation. So you know, we think that that's a really critically important part of our society. Mm -hmm. And you know, fortunately, Vermont has a fairly high home ownership uh, rate. Um, but but at the same time, the disparity between you know white homeowners and BIPOC homeowners is fairly dramatic. Um, so you know, starting to address those kinds of issues as well is important to the realtors. Yeah, that partially could be an availability issue, right? Because people who have housing sure. are more able, especially mm -hmm. own housing, mm -hmm. are more able to to uh, to buy new housing. Right. Because they have this wealth that's in property. Sure, they values. built up their equity in their house, and now they can move it forward if they can find something, right? If they and, can find you know, something, yeah. And yeah. and so and that and to what you're talking about, that two to three hundred thousand um, market range is really critical for people that are potentially able to move out of rental housing right. into a homeowner market, right? That's yeah. the that's the type of you know um, price range that you're looking at for people that are jumping out of you know, that don't have that wealth, Correct. that property wealth, that are jumping out of a rental market. Mm -hmm. And that's not available anywhere in Vermont. No. That's correct, yeah. yeah. I know, yeah. I just, I, when I did my research, it said Vermont ranks seventh highest in home ownership, mm -hmm. which I thought was, that was pretty good. Yeah, that's so good. It's very yeah. interesting, yeah. on a national yeah. level, five years ago, it was about 72% mm -hmm. of people own their home, mm -hmm. families. And the number today is in the low 60s. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. we bec we're becoming a renter nation. Right, which is another whole show, Driven by a whole right? bunch of issues. Yeah. Uh, one of the, your, your comment, uh, Ben, about uh, infrastructure. There's a study that's recently been done by a group of planners in the state of Vermont. And in their conclusion on their two-page white paper, they make this statement, which is so profound. But again, we caution that residential construction at the level necessary to create an adequate supply of safe, affordable, and efficient housing for Vermonters at or below a medium household income will not be possible without provision of infrastructure in more communities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they back it up with 13 pages of study. Well, and there was uh, Kathy Davis, who's the uh, head of the um Chamber of Commerce, I think, in Chittenden County, right, Kathy? Yeah, it's the mm -hmm. Lake Champlain. Yeah, and yes, Lake, Lake Champlain. Champlain. Mm -hmm. And she said, she wrote a wonderful article, which I read the whole thing because it was fascinating, that was um, talking about the impact of this shortage on the economy because employers can't hire people in because mm -hmm. they can't find homes, yep. so therefore that's less workers, and it just... 
because what she talked about is just that triple, you know, down effect that it's there's it a, really impacts our economy. There's and a I gentleman think. in Morrisville that manages and has been successful working with different builders in managing over 100 brand new units of rental housing. And he has a waiting list. Wow. Mm -hmm. And he could build another 100 if he could find the land, get the permits, and yeah. get Act 250. Yeah. One of the problems with Act 250, and it's so true on single family homes as well as apartments, mm -hmm. is by their regulations, builder can only build 10 units within five years, within five miles of each other. That's correct. Without going through all kinds of master planning hoops with the, with, with the Act 250. Yep. So if you buy a 50-acre parcel of land and you're a builder and you want to build 20 houses, single-family homes for the start of community, uh, you can't do it without going through about a two-year planning process yeah, see, through Act 250. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the issues that we saw when I served on the Act 250 Commission, was the, the lead time and the expense involved in trying to do these types of projects was just incredible. One of the interesting um, construction techniques that's being tried in the country. It's been done in New York, it's been done in New Jersey, it's been done in California, it's been done big in Europe, uh, is 3D construction. 3D printer, construction of a house out of concrete. Oh. It's fast. Now the printer costs about $300,000. It's a huge machine. Mm. And it just, pour, and basically it just pours the concrete. It just, the concrete you put, you put the floor plan in the printer and it pours the concrete. It goes all the way up to the like roof. The foundation and everything? Wow. Foundation walls, internal walls, everything. I'd love to see that. that cost, it cost about $8,000 to build a three-bedroom house over and above the cost of the land and the cost of the printer. But if you can only do 10 a year, 10 at a time, five years apart, mm -hmm. There's no economic scale for that. Right, right. Uh, but that's, that's, it's very interesting. Um, I've been following it. I've been trying to pay attention to it because I think it has a future. Uh, mm -hmm. Concrete's a very good insulator. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it, there's, there's a couple of houses in New York that have been about, they're about two years old now. Uh, everybody seems to like them and, and nice. seem, they seem to be doing well. Um, and again, you know, the printer is the expensive part. Buying the land and and buying the machine to do the printing. Now, this mm -hmm. may be a political uh, question which we, where we don't want to go, but there must be a reason why, act, I mean, two years is ludicrous. I mean, you should be able to get your permitting and all the stuff you want to do in a little briefer time than you. So there must be a reason why this is being stretched out and um, making builders sort of depressed and not want to, not want to mm -hmm. do it. I mean, is it all about the environment? Is that what we're doing? Bottom line, you think? If, if I may, yeah. Yeah, please, only because it is a political answer, but I... Well, not, not so much a political answer, but, you know, I think that, that you know, back to, to Ken's comment on the Act 250, the, the 1055 rule, this is one of our specific objectives, you know, in terms of uh, eliminating or modifying that. And what's the reason for it? Well, the reason is, you know, that small builder that we want to support in Vermont villages who has been building, you know, two or three homes. Um, let's say they build three homes a year, you know, so first year, great, second year, great, third year, great, fourth year. If they build that one additional unit, they're in Act 250. And so now they have to provide you know, wastewater, stormwater, right. all of the, the things. And, and I did want to step back to permit, I'm sorry, but no, you know, to right step ahead. back to permitting a little bit, um, that, you know, it is an, Act 250 is kind of the, the, the term that we use, mm -hmm. but it's the Agency of Natural Resources Permits, the Act 250 Oversight, and municipal zoning and planning, those are the encompassing permitting issues, right? And, you know, I've been concerned, hey, we get Act 250 changed and, you know, towns don't take advantage of it. 
um, you know, why are, you know, why go through the effort? Um, but I've realized that there are certain municipalities that will be very enthusiastic about this. St. Albans has been one that, that's really taken advantage of TIF districts and, and you know, downtown redevelopment. Um, other, other municipalities will be like that. And, and so, you know, our goal or our efforts will not be, you know, wasted. Um, but it is going to be up to local zoning to, to kind of embrace it as well. Um, so the 1055 rule, you know, you can see what happens. You know, it really retards those smaller builders from being active in their local markets. Um, you know, we think if, if that changed, that, um, that they would be able to build these, you know, two units here, four units there. And, and look at, I mean, I look at the city of Montpelier all the time, and I'm like, well, this is great. If we, got, if we could avoid Act 250 review in downtowns and neighborhood development areas, um, you know, that would be great. Montpelier could build a lot more housing, but where, you know, right? And we haven't identified those areas yet. And that's another critical piece, um, you know, to, to kind of what we're thinking, that, um, you know, it may not be 20 unit subdivisions. It may be two here and one there and four there. But if we could, if we could change or modify that rule so that that, that small builder could say, I'm going to build what I can find in this community, and I'm going to I'm going to bring new housing online. That they would then, you know, they would be doing exactly what we need them to do. And yeah. um, you know, we feel like that's a much better solution, um, you know, to try and get some infrastructure and, and some building in downtowns and neighborhood development areas. Well, and it may not even be necessarily a, a physically new construction. Mm -hmm. um, it could be rebuilding or, re, or, or refurbishing something that's yeah. there already, right? You yeah. Have, Vermont and like much of New England has these large Victorian style houses. Many of them are in downtown areas. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes they're either underutilized or they're run down or mm -hmm. you know haven't been um, maintained. Right. I think uh, the um, ACCD did a, did a look at this or the, the Department of Housing to look mm -hmm. at this and said we think there's between seven and eight thousand units currently that are that are in this state of not not being mm -hmm. able to, to be utilized for housing because they don't meet zoning, they don't meet um, fire, you know, safety. fire safety requirements. Mm -hmm. uh, the city of St. Albans, um, you know, they've done a bunch of stuff with housing, yep. you know, both up near the interstate as well as down in the village. And the village alone, like right on Main Street, I think they added 200 units of housing yep. simply by with the existing structures, mm -hmm. like either add another story or you know, split uh, uh, what was a single family home into a duplex, mm -hmm. you know, you can, you know, well, again, those large Victorian ho houses that, you know, sure. you don't need 5,000 square feet. Most families don't anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so you can split it. Right. You know, and that's, there's some stuff we can do with that where you don't necessarily trigger Act 250. That's not going to be the case everywhere. But mm -hmm. you may also have an open lot of like, oh, you could subdivide this one lot that's in a downtown area mm -hmm. and build another building next to it, you know. Right. Right, and think about commercial buildings, and you know there are need for office space in the, in this current environment. Um, you know, there's there's going to be a, uh, I think, a serious retooling of a lot of properties. You know, and especially in the downtown areas that um, that are are deemed commercial at this point, but the most you know the highest and best use down the road may be residential, mm -hmm. and and being able to clean those up, make them available. Um, and then turn them into productive residential properties is, you know, certainly something that's going to have to happen at the same time. So this is uh, this is funny. I um, uh, was doing some research on this issue, looking at uh, mm -hmm. the campaign for Vermont did a report back in the spring that one of the things we looked at was what is the available housing stock. Mm -hmm. And um, at that point in time, uh, back in June, we had determined that there was less than 1%, in fact, it was probably one half of 1% turnover mm -hmm. a year over year in the housing market, which is incredibly sluggish. Um, right. Like, just nothing's available. And if it is available, it usually, it often awesome. needed work, right, or rehab mm -hmm. or whatever. One of the things we noticed when we were doing that is there was a commercial building in South Burlington right next to the airport mm -hmm. that was a bank. Um, so like a commercial bank, um, and had been repurposed into a into a condo development. Yeah. So it's an office building, mm -hmm. right. but it has condos inside of it. Right. And this is an example, of like kind of what you're talking about, of yeah. taking some of this innovative. Maybe we don't need all this office space anymore in today's world. Mm -hmm. People are working from home. Right. Turn it into housing. I think you're going to see that more and more post COVID. Not only with the office buildings, but uh, some some of the motels, hotels, mm -hmm. bed and breakfasts that are around the state that are 
probably struggling very hard mm -hmm. to, to maintain livelihood. So you bring up a, a good point. Um, something that um, I had in my notes here is that uh, between 2014 and 2019, we went from 1,000 uh, units of short-term rentals in the mm -hmm. state right. to 8,000 units mm -hmm. over that five-year period. Um, do you think that's having any impact on um, the availability of housing stock, or are these units that are weren't residential necessarily that are becoming short-term rentals? Mm -hmm. Like, do you think that that's having an impact, or is this sort of just a, a side issue to this? Right. So, I think that you know, I'm not sure where that 1,000 number came from, but you know, certainly when I think about 8,000 units in short-term rental in in the state of Vermont, and I start adding up the number of condominiums at ski areas up and down the Green Mountains. You know, I'm way over 8,000 probably at that point in time. So, you know, there's a lot of concern about short-term rentals, you know, the kind of a two, two issues. You know, one is that it's taking long-term residential properties out of the marketplace, right? And that's, that's been the big push. Um, you know, in reality, you know, probably most of those properties, and you know, Ken and I have worked with a ton of second homeowners in Stowe um, who said, I'm gonna use this thing 30 days a year, and I wanna get some rental income to offset my taxes, you know, and, and, it, and it's a top-notch resort where they had their own management program, but now so many of those owners have turned over to Airbnb that they're showing up as a kind of a new statistic, but in reality, I would suspect that most short-term rental properties were short-term rental properties before we started counting them. Before you we know? started counting them. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Now, you know, so there, there's that residential component, right? And if it's a single family home that could have been rented to somebody year round, but isn't because somebody says, hey, I can make an investment in this single family home and use it purely as a short-term rental property, not even use it myself. Right. You know, that's, you know, obviously a legit concern. How big is that? Um, you know, we don't know, obviously, um, but I don't think, I think when I look at short-term rental properties and I start thinking about all the condominiums that are naturals for that kind of activity, um, you know, that's, it's going to be significant in Vermont, which is a, is a resort and vacation state. Yes, yeah, so that's what I wonder, because you, you hear some, um, you know, some of the pushback. I mean, Burlington's going through this right now. Sure. I live in Burlington. Yep. Um, you know, my neighbor has a, um, an Airbnb that she's, you know, it's a live-in situation. She doesn't even have a separate unit hmm. necessarily. Um, she has a spare bedroom, essentially yep. what it is. And, uh, and so we're having this whole debate and the, the argument against it is it takes away from um, the, the permanent housing stock. Right. But I'm not, I kind of think that there's probably more going on there, right? To your mm -hmm. point, maybe we're just now calling these short-term rentals. Really, this was a second homeowner, you know, uh, vacation rental uh, situation before we started calling a short-term rental, mm -hmm. and then, then you have some of the some of the newer units, maybe that are you know in-law apartments and that sort mm -hmm. of thing, and then um, that are now in there, and those probably wouldn't be standalone rental units because right. they they weren't in that market before, and they're just mm -hmm. now in this short-term rental market. So yep. I really kind of wonder how much it is actually impacting mm -hmm. our you know. Uh, our, uh, our long-term housing stock. Right, right. And most of those those property owners want to use it somewhat throughout the year. And so mm -hmm. that really precludes any kind of a long-term rental anyhow. Right. So, you know, I mean, you know, there's there's definitely that that component and, you know, it's, it's a concern. I, I think it has a lot more to do with where it's located than, you know, so in other words, a short-term rental in a condominium at the base of a ski area is seems like a kind of a normal use a short-term rental in a residential neighborhood that could potentially be used for a you know year-round residential uh, property oh, you know has a different right. um, different weight to it and and so you know I think that you know while the state has tried on a statewide level to in, to have a rental registry um, you know short-term rentals have been regulated since 2018 so the regulation wouldn't change at all really quite honestly um, you know, they'll do the same thing, pay rooms and meals tax and adhere to property or uh, health and safety codes. So right. they have to do that. Um, but I do think that there is, you know, on a, on a local level, there's going to be more discussion and more debate. And, um, 
you know, and, and there's places where it's appropriate and places maybe where a municipality wants to, you know, to regulate it. Um, and, and Burlington is an example of much more of a residential market, even though we know it's a, you know, it's a great place to come and visit. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a bigger residential market. And I think they're, you know, they're kind of looking at it from that perspective. This is Burlington is still the largest uh, tourism destination in the state, though. Yeah. Just in case yeah. anyone was wondering I, that. I Googled this issue and there's so many articles on it. It's a big deal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. People yep. are yep. probably trying to figure out how to get those taxes or whatever. Yeah, it's all about how to get the taxes. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, and, and Airbnb has been remitting yeah. taxes since 2018. I mean, you know, we hear all the time, short-term rentals are unregulated business. They aren't. They have been paying their rooms and meals taxes. I mean, you know, if somebody has avoided the regulation, that's a different that's story. That's a different story, yeah. You know, but, but for the most part, you know, the majority of folks, and I've talked to different people who say, I wouldn't do it any other way than Airbnb because it's so simple. They remit the tax to the state. You know, all I've yeah. got to do is sign up with them. And we used to, I, in 2005, I had 245 properties in Stowe oh, that wow. I managed, or in the Stowe area, mm -hmm. some in Waterbury. And we managed at our office, had three girls, that's all they did. Yep. And we collected the sales tax for all of our clients and remitted it to the state on, with their tax number. They each had to get their own tax mm -hmm. number. But we collected yeah. it and remitted it to the state. So they wouldn't, A, they would be in compliance, and B, they wouldn't have to do the paperwork. Yeah. And yeah. if they weren't there, you, you had to pay the bill for... Well, we took it out. Of the, took it, the, he got it on the front end. We took it out. Of, we took it out of the. Uh, uh, if you rented the house, we took it out of the sh your rental before mm -hmm. we sent it to them. Yeah. 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 Well, and so just, if you rented a house for a thousand dollars a night, we charge you eleven hundred because it's a hundred dollars oh, tax. I see. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. Yeah. So yeah. how do we? So how do we go about? Um, how do we go about solving this issue? Like, mm -hmm. there's, you know, obviously there's multiple facets to it. Um, if you could. You know, get the legislature, or maybe it's not more than just the legislature. Maybe it's um, sure. you know the the markets or the local municipalities, or a combination of the three. Like, what what do you think it's going to take to solve this problem mm -hmm. of how do we get affordable entry level um, houses that people can buy? Right. I I think it's a combination sure. of factors, um, and I won't hit them all. Peter will hit some, but. Uh, I think, you know, Act 250 was designed, as Peter said, because it, almost nobody had zoning. And the mess that went on down at, Mount Snow, uh, down at Haystack Mountain is what precipitated it all. And, and, uh, but today, most towns, there are still those outliers that don't have zoning, but I venture a guess 90% of all the towns in the state of Vermont have zoning of some nature, and some have very sophisticated zoning. Mo many do. Uh, I know in Lamoille County, out of the 10 towns, there's seven at least that have very sophisticated zoning. So a recognition on the state's behalf that those people, those towns that have that level of zoning should be able to set their own rules and regulations mm -hmm. and then have the state regulatory agencies get out of that life as an example uh, one of the recommendations in the barriers to affordable housing that uh, is discussed is legislation says that no more than four units per acre can be built. It says no more than four single family homes per acre can be built. The ACCD has interpreted that to mean that each house has to be on a quarter acre. Well, that's not what it says. You could cluster all four of those single family homes on it, on half an acre and leave a half acre open land. Oh. But that's not the way they interpret it. That's for the neighborhood downtown designation right. uh, rules. Let the town set those criteria uh, and take out the language single family home because why not have a four unit duplex right. on a square, a square foot of 1,500 square foot foundation on an acre? You still got four living units on an acre. So a lot of it is regulation that uh, is too often, I, mean, I saw it when I was an Act 250 commissioner, 
too often regulations are being interpreted, written and interpreted by people that don't have a clue on what's going on in the real world of building houses and making the economy tick. Yeah. Sorry. So is it, is it um, so maybe what it is in, to some degree with the Act 250 discussion, I know Peter, this is kind of your area of expertise, but maybe it's that um, a uh, we should allow um, the state to issue waivers to uh, towns and municipalities mm -hmm. who have a zoning process that is deemed to meet the criteria of Act 250, right. so that that process then takes over and mm -hmm. Act two, and you're exempt from Act 250 if you're building in that municipality because their zoning regulations and process is deemed to meet or exceed the requirements of Act 250. Right, right, and you know, so there was a bill H 400 introduced last year, which was really pretty much the language it was from the previous legislative session as well. You know, and, and that was part of it would be to avoid um, Act 250 review in downtowns and neighborhood development areas that have zoning and have municipal services. That's really the key, right? Yeah. And then you get into that whole thing with municipal services. Is the sewer plant um, perm currently permitted? And is it, does it have overflows? And you know, that's the whole environmental piece um, that, that, you know, that, that it always is kind of the fallback. Well, we can't do that because, you know, if the, you know, the, if there was a sewer overflow here, adding more capacity obviously would, would impact that. Um, the reality is the overflows are very minor. Um, I do think, you know, in terms of, of waterways, because let's face it, almost every municipality we have has a, a river or a stream that runs right through the middle of it, you know, protecting those floodways um, is something that I haven't exactly figured out yet because that's really an agency of natural resources thing, right? Um, and, and, and also uh, runoff because quite honestly, while s combined sewer overflows, you know, seem like a, a very big deal, they're a very small number and you know, runoff from roads and roofs and impervious surfaces is a much bigger, uh, contributes much more um, to pollution to the you know, waters of the state of Vermont. So that's, you know, that needs to be addressed as well. And those are agency things, not specifically Act 250 things. Um, and I, I think that there's gonna be some tension there. You know, how, do we, how do we make sure that if we did relieve municipalities from Act 250 review, that they would still be, uh, or, or those kinds of protections would be in place. And I, you know, I think that the Agency of Natural Resources certainly has the capability to, you know, to monitor that and make sure that it's okay. Um, but, but that's, you know, how are we gonna create some development? Uh, the builder that, that Ken has referred to has told me, he said, if I didn't have an Act 250 review in downtowns and neighborhood development areas, it's the only place I would build. He goes, if I could avoid Act 250, the two years, the amount of money, the amount of, of permits that I need to get in place, because it's not just the, the, you know, it's not the permit fee or application, it's the engineers and the planning that need to go in just to be able to submit an Act 250 review. So that's, and the art, one of the arguments for Act 250, and you, and you see this, is that, um, you know, it, it, the, the incentive is to build in downtown areas, right? Mm -hmm. That's what they, that's what Act 250, if you ask someone who's a, who's a proponent of Act 250, and, um, but that's the answer, it's mm -hmm. to incentivize downtown development. So in this case, it sounds like Act 250 is almost tripping over itself and trying mm -hmm. to get to that goal. Right, right. Um, and you see, I mean, what's interesting about this, because uh, um, what, what year did Act 250 go into effect? 69. 69, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you can see a difference when you drive across the border into upstate New York mm -hmm. or New Hampshire. Um, there is a uh, there is a noticeable difference in how development has happened mm -hmm. in New Hampshire versus and, and in New York versus Vermont. And uh, Act 250 has literally changed the landscape mm -hmm. of our state because it has, in many cases, incentivized downtown development. The problem is all of our downtown development is now single family homes and there's no room to grow anymore. Mm -hmm. I think. That's kind of sort a lot of, of the analysis. space is used, yes. The space is mm -hmm. used. Yeah. And so now you have to start figuring out how to how to reuse the space yep. or um, you know, work, you know, in some of the areas where we may be tripping over ourselves mm -hmm. to to incentivize development. Sure. Yeah. Let me throw a time is getting short, so let me throw something at you that you can chew on. Go ahead. 
and it, I mentioned it briefly, opportunity zones. Um, there's 38 opportunity zones, I believe, in the state of Vermont and 18 different municipalities. Mm -hmm. And that's fantastic. The Opportunity Zone program is a federal program in the 2017 tax bill, and it's a, it, the concept is fantastic. Now, the Opportunity Zones are only as effective as the Opportunity Funds, which fund development in the zones. Mm -hmm. And that was the way it was set up, is so that if I were an investor, I could invest some ser serious money into an Opportunity Fund and ha get some real tax advantages but that money would be available in the, the distressed areas around the nation to help with housing and or, or infrastructure particularly. Now, you take the town of Johnson. Johnson, the entire town is an opportunity zone. Has been since the day it was first instituted, 2016. We've not had one single development in that town because there's no opportunity fund that cares to take the risk on the return investment to invest in the town of Johnson. Johnson's not got, you know, it's got the college and it's got the art studio, but the downtown area is sort of uh, what is the downtown struggled. Area down there? Mm -hmm. it's, it's really a struggle at the moment. Is there a downtown? I'm not being funny. Yeah, there very is. Uh, very definitely. Uh, mm -hmm. About a three block area mm -hmm. you know, that, that's oh. bigger than Stowe, the downtown. Oh. <laughs> I've commented two or three times recently in the last six months, and nobody's picked up on it yet, but that maybe the state ought to do what it did with the uh, industrial development way back in the, in the 70s, when they developed the original thought of the, of the GBICs and the, and the Memorial Economic Development was the state had a pot of money. They gave it to us to take a chance on a developer. Mm -hmm. Or on a guy that had an invention. Right. One of the chances we took in Lamoille County was a young guy that came to us one day and said, I've got a great idea for a product, and I, but I need a few thousand dollars to make it work. It's concept two. Oh. Mm -hmm. ah. And the Drusackers had a bicycle turned upside down in the, in the loft of their barn, and we went up there and they showed us how it worked. And we threw them a bunch of money and they started building it. We also had a guy come in with a very ingenious idea one day, and we threw him a bunch of money and he went defunct. Mm -hmm. But the goal was to take a chance. Right, right. And I think we should do that with the Opportunity Fund. I think the state should develop an Opportunity Fund that's willing to take a chance on the Johnsons of Vermont well, and help a, I think that's in building idea. up the downtown. Yeah. There's, there's beautiful buildings there that could be, that need repurposing as single family and yeah. or multifamily, uh, maybe not rental units, maybe condos take one of those huge old Victorian homes and make it three condos. So somebody right. has ownership yep. because as Peter said, it's clear that generational wealth starts with home ownership. Yep. Um, it's, statistically, $72,000 of equity, if a, if a person buys a house in the fourth year of ownership, they'll have $72,000 more in equity than somebody that rents that same house. Oh. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you know that's significant. People don't think about that, but that's that's where you that's start great. building wealth is the equity in the real estate tradition. What town was this? Um, Pardon? What town were you talking about? What town was um, Johnson? Johnson. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, um, that's a great town. They have a lot of spirit in that town. They yeah. do a lot from the community. It's a and they're trying so hard to build that yep. community back up, but they just need that one person yeah. to push. Mm -hmm. You know, we've been hoping and hoping and hoping to get a. Uh, opportunity fund. Nice. I work with a gentleman down in Atlanta, Georgia, that has an opportunity fund, but he invests most of his stuff in Texas. I've been trying to convince him to come to Vermont, but that's great. Um, Good for you. you know, I think I think that's I think the state could do something mm -hmm. um, with a state opportunity fund, where the state puts some money in and structure it like we did back in the day with the. Uh, economic development. Uh, so there is an investment piece to this too, that the investments in Vermont from the financing side, it's not that there isn't money, it's just that it, the investments look too risky. Well, certainly certainly in the opportunity zones, that's why they're opportunity zones, is because they, they are distressed. Yeah. And so the return, you know, every investor wants a return on his investment to some degree. Mm -hmm. yeah. It seems to me the opportunity zone would be perfect. I don't understand why they don't feel that that's, that's an okay investment. I'm not sure it's been run up the flight bowl. Oh, mm -hmm. that's too bad. Yeah. Yeah. 
Too bad. And it can, correct me if I'm wrong, but it can be for specific projects too, right? Oh, yeah, like yeah. in other words, if an investor said, you know, I'm willing to invest in this project and it happens to be in an opportunity zone, they would be able to reap the rewards of the opportunity zone benefits. Yeah, the tax right. incentives. Exactly, and yeah. yeah. I have a client that owns 22 buildings in South Royalton. South Royalton's an opportunity zone. Hmm. And he's been trying to find an opportunity fund. Yeah. So he's I'm surprised at the builders out there that they he's exploring it. starting his own fund yeah. because yep. of the tax incentives. Sure, but huh. it takes time. Well, to listen, do. I know we have a minute left. I don't know if there's anything else you'd like to say to wrap it up. I'll let Peter wrap. Yeah, if, if I could, you know, given the the incredible federal funding that's occurred in the last two years, you know, the the pandemic number one, ARPA, uh, now an infrastructure fund. There is, we are awash in federal funds. Um, you know, the, the opportunity is a one-time opportunity, though. And, you know, I, I look at it from like a municipal level. You know, we've got, they've got X number of dollars coming in, and they can spend it on the library or the fire engine or the municipal wastewater plant. And that, that has and, to be specific? It, well, they're, you know, they're going to be general funds, and there will be rules for those, but you know, generally, you know, towns will be making decisions, the state will be making huge decisions on how to apply these funds, and you know, the more that goes into that base, it's not pretty, and, but it's, you know, wastewater is like a key to any kind of you know, real, real opportunities for development. And, and you know, quite honestly, plants that are permitted, plants that are, are brought up to speed, or expanded, um, you know, we feel like would be an excellent use of those funds, and we're going to encourage the legislature to, you know, to direct as much as they can in those directions. Um, it's a it's a one time opportunity, and it, you know, in the next two or three or four years, it's going to end. And you know, if if we use it correctly, yeah. we're going to make great progress. It needs to be in conjunction with some reform to permitting, and uh, you know, we feel Where like is that. Is it can, in the legislature? Did it come out? Was it in one of the uh, bills that passed this year? Um, well, they've done it in various ways, yeah. I mean, you know, so there were a lot of bills that didn't make it to the finish line that would have directed funds, but it, the funds ended up in the budget, uh, the budget bill. Um, and, and, you know, we'll just continue to encourage that yeah. so that, yeah. that properties can be redeveloped in downtown areas, that municipal wastewater systems want. can be improved. Yeah. And, you know, that we, and, and then what happens? You know, if we start to have some new construction, we create flow to the marketplace. You know, one of the things that, that, that we've always encouraged, I think, you know, we understand that housing is a, a paradigm, you know, and, and it goes from the step out of homelessness to the step into home ownership. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if we can help with that, we create better fluidity in the marketplace and we get back to a more normal market, you know, instead of this just peak and trough Absolutely. and, you know, real, the real pressures, you know, that, that, nor that the market conditions we're looking at right now. So we, we really feel like that's the opportunity at that, you know, whether it's workforce housing or, or that base price point of housing. You know, if we can start to add units at that level, we start to create motion in the marketplace and, and things become more balanced and more stable. Awesome. Well, hopefully we get there. And uh, we are out of time, unfortunately. So um, thank you both so much yes, for much. joining us. And thank you for, for watching. And we'll uh, see you next week. And until the meantime, keep listening Beyond the Sound Bites. Awesome.